Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you all for taking the time out to be here today. I'm Karan Mulchandani, the founder of a passion-based social enterprise called Enlightened Sapiens, and I'll be your host for today. On behalf of the South Asia Bonsai Federation, I'd like to extend a very, very warm welcome to all of you here today. As you may know, South Asia Bonsai Federation consists of five countries, Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and India. And this month, South Asia Bonsai Federation turns three years old. And to acknowledge this milestone, we have a very, very special program and session for you here today. We have the highly respected, the world-renowned master Peter Chan here with us, and he's gonna share his immense wealth of knowledge with all of us here today live. I hope you're all excited though, as we all are. Uh, and he's gonna talk about field growing techniques for bonsai. And now I'd like to invite Mrs. Sneha Prasad, the president of South Asia Bonsai Federation to say a few words. Good morning, ma'am. Good afternoon, Karan. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon to all the participants from all over the world and especially our bonsai friends from South Asia region, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Nepal. Today, we celebrate two achievements. As Karan has already said that we have turned three years. That means South Asia Bonsai Federation completes three years of its tenure in the month of July. And the second academic endeavor of South Asia Bonsai Federation known as SABF Book Club completes one year on the 10th of July. Today, our club has become exactly one year old. To celebrate SABF Book Club academic feat we are really honored and privileged to have Mr. Peter Chan, who's my guru and mentor from UK with us, a legendary and acclaimed author of many, many bonsai books. Peter, our sincere thanks for sharing your valuable time with us today. Before we proceed further, I would like to share one good news with you all. Karan, can we have the slide? Huh. So South Asia Bonsai Federation is launching a digital school for the benefit of bonsai enthusiasts. This school will be focused on enhancing digital skills and techniques. The details of this school will be shared at the end of this session. So without taking too much of your time, I again thank you all for joining us. And over to you, Karan, please proceed with the program. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Um, and now we have uh, from the West Zone, Mrs. Santosh Parmar, the SABF International Consultant for WBFF, who would be introducing Master Peter Chan. Thank you. A very good afternoon, friends. With the blessings of our SAP president, Ma'am Snee Prasad, the SABF Book Club is privileged to have one of the foremost and globally recognized bonsai master, Sir Peter Chan, among us to refine our knowledge on the field growing techniques for bonsai. His dedication to this noble art and his books till date inspire us all to become bonsai masters ourselves. It is truly an honor to introduce somebody as illustrious and inspiring as Master Peter Chan. Welcome Master Peter Chan. Born and educated in India, an electrical engineer by profession, 
Master Peter Chan went to UK in 1963 and thereafter started his experimental journey with his beautiful art of bonsai. The list of his achievements in the plant world is non-exhaustive, but to name a few. Peter Chan, sir, have authored many books and in many languages. He is 21 times gold medalist for the Chelsea Award, one of the most prestigious award of UK. He is the only person to be awarded gold medal at the RHS for one man bonsai show in 1982. He is the founder member of the Federation of British Bonsai Association. Today, his nursery, is UK's premier bonsai nursery, a must visit place for all bonsai lovers. It is indeed a pleasure to have you amongst us, sir, today. And friends, once again, let us all welcome Master Peter Chan. Thank you. Back to you, Karan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, so yes, we're going to begin our program and uh, we're going to start sharing the Peter, uh, presentation and welcome Master Peter Chan. So welcome everyone. As you can see me, I'm going to give you the talk as a PowerPoint presentation. But uh, as I go along, I will interact with you and I'm welcoming all sorts of questions. I have a list of questions, but I leave it in the hands of uh, your master ceremonies current to determine who asks what questions. But without further ado, I will now start this lecture. So having come from an academic background, I will give it to you almost like a lecture. So I will give you a little bit of history of how I started. Now this picture, you must be wondering why I'm showing this. Now this is the day when we had our convocation at IIT Kharagpur, 1962. I graduated in April 62. This was taken in December 62. And I show this picture because can you see the sweet peas behind in the background? We used to grow sweet peas five and six foot tall. And Kharagpur is a very dry, sandy area, almost like a desert. And I was the gardening secretary of my hall of residence. And I show this picture because this is where I actually started all my gardening activities. As a boy, I used to grow the odd plants, you know, the baleful, jasmine and things like that in the balcony, lemon trees, uh, chili plants, that sort of thing. But when I went to Arti Kharagpur, I was the gardening secretary. And this is the handiwork. Behind me, you can see those tall sweet peas. And we always used to win the prize for the gardening competitions. By the way, the guy standing next to me, his name is called Raj Cornelius. He went to America and he became head of a very, very big high-tech company pr producing the first fiber optic cable in the world. So, and he was from Lucknow, and I'm going to show you in a minute, the kurta I'm wearing is the Lucknow kurta he gave me in 1958, which I'm still wearing more than 60 years later, and it's still in beautiful shape. So let's move on. Now, this is a picture of my wife at a Chelsea flower show. We used to exhibit at Chelsea. I won 21 consecutive gold medals, and I stopped doing it in 2006. I had done enough at that time. So a lot of people wonder why the nursery is called herons. I don't like to be you know, bombastic and show that it is Peter Chan's nursery and this and that. A lot of nurseries call it this person's nursery, that person's nursery. The name of the house or the nursery that we purchased was called herons and I've always stuck with it. And herons are the bird, is a very symbolic and a lucky uh, symbol of uh, uh, in Chinese folklore, and we've stuck with the name. So this is a quick look of what the nursery looks like. Uh, and you can see there are thousands and thousands of plants spread over seven and a half, nearly eight acres. And we have growing fields where we grow the trees in the field, and then we deal with them. So we are now almost like 
80% self-sufficient in all the trees that we sell. So these are maples. We are very fond of growing maples. So this is a view of uh, some of the maple trees. So in autumn, the maples look like this. Maples are one of the most beautiful trees in the temperate region because they go through changes of color. Spring color is one color, summer color is another color, and autumn color is absolutely stunning and beautiful. Okay, now I'm here to teach you something or share with you some of the uh, techniques that we use and open ground growing or growing trees in the field is a widely acknowledged method of producing bonsai. Now, why do you use this technique? The reason why we use open ground technique is to reduce the time scale. So instead of waiting 50 years, you can only like reduce the time scale to three, four, five years, and you can get the same thickness of trunk. So the thickness of the trunk is very important and to develop a strong tree. The thicker the trunk, the older you perceive the tree to be. It is like cheating in a way. You're fooling people to think that it is very old tree. I remember when I first started doing bonsai and all these flower shows, they would say, oh, how old is that tree? They'll say, oh, it's 100 years old because it's got a thick trunk. But if you are clever enough, you will know that just because the trunk is thick, it doesn't mean it's old. I know that from my experience living in India, you can get trees that grow very thick. Bougainvillea, you can get in 10 years, trunk as thick as your thigh. You know, ficus is as thick as your thigh, thigh in five, 10 years. Even in this country where it's very cold, we can grow certain types of trees in about 10 years, very, very thick. So it saves a lot of time and you get a thick trunk. Now, like everything in life, whatever you do, there are advantages and disadvantages. Not everything in the world is hunky-dory. Okay, what are the advantages? It saves years of waiting. So that is, of course, a very, very big plus. As you get older, you realize that you have a limited time on this earth. People don't like to confront that fact, but we are all mortal. We have to die sometime. And to save the time is a very important factor in one's life. So it saves years of waiting. So as I said, you can cut short the time, say like in four or five years, you can produce a trunk which could normally take 10 to 30 years if you grew it in a pot or in some other way. So uh, those are the main advantages. The disadvantages I will come to you as I explain to you as I go along, because there are disadvantages. Okay, now, of course, having seen what is happening in India, but I have not been for a few years, but things may be changing. What you need for open ground is that you have to have enough land. Now, in this country, most people have gardens. Not everyone has five or seven acres like I do, but you may have a garden, whatever a garden is, or even a flower bed is what we call open ground. When I lived in my previous house, my garden was only 200 feet long by about 40 feet wide, but I grew everything in the ground, in the flower beds. Instead of growing dahlias and all these pansies and funny things, flowers, I chucked them all out and started growing bonsai in the flower beds. So that is open ground growing. You don't have to have masses of field. As long as you have a flower bed, that constitutes the soil conditions where you can use for growing. And of course, irrigation, if it's just a small scale thing, then you can water with hose pipe or watering can. I remember that before I came to this nursery, I had what is called an allotment. In England, because people during the war years in the Second World War, we were encouraged to grow our own food, but not everyone had a big garden. So they gave people pieces of land to rent. You could rent about one quarter acre for like four or five pounds, which is just like the equivalent of Indian money, maybe 10 rupees a year to hire that piece of land and you could grow your vegetables in it. So that was a very popular thing. But in the 60s and 70s, it fell into disuse. And I remember before I came here, I had allotment where everyone was growing runner beans, beetroot, potatoes, and all that. And they were wondering, who is this stupid Chinese fellow growing trees in the land? Uh, but they didn't realize that I was not that stupid. 
because whatever I was growing, I was developing for bonsai to sell when I came to the nursery. So you have to have an open piece of land where you can grow. But uh, then some soil is very fertile. On our nursery, when I tell people that when we grow in the field, I don't use any fertilizer at all. The soil is very, very rich. I used to have to put uh, horse manure, you know, in your case, you would use cow manure. So I do put manure in the land, but generally speaking, if the soil is a good fertile soil, you don't even have to put fertilizer. Okay, then when it comes to the technique, how long do we leave the trees in the ground? Okay, now that depends on how big you want the trunk to be. What I would say is that you need to leave a tree at least one to two years. When you plant it for the first year, it doesn't do much. But after the second year, it then starts racing away. And by five years, I find that you will get very, very fast results. So you've got to be prepared to invest between two to five years to get reasonable results. If you think that just putting it in the ground for one year will do the trick, then forget it. One year is not enough. You have to give more than one year, at least two years. And then how often do you trim the roots? This is a very vexed subject. Some people say that you've got to dig around the tree all the time so that the roots don't get too mad and you can lift it up easily and it encourages fine roots to grow. I find that if you do that, you can set the tree back. So I would not advise you to do it, certainly not for the first two years. For the first two years, don't do anything. Just let it grow. Just let it grow. Um, Okay, now, assuming that you have left it to grow for two to five years, then how to dig it up? I know that depends on how big your operation is. I think just digging it with a spade, in, in England we use a spade, I don't know what you use in India, you probably use these great big mattocks or kodali, I think you call it, to dig, but we will use big machines. I will show you on the slides when I come to it, how we dig up our trees. And then what we do after digging, and then what to do after you've dug, and then the styling starts. So now, enough for the lecture. Now let us show you the slides and show you how we do it. Now, this is a picture of a big juniper that is grown. And you notice that they've raised it up. So I think someone was asking about growing things in tires. Now, I know why they asked that question, because some people may have introduced that. I'm not sure whether it's gimmick or they may have seen this sort of thing being done. This picture, by the way, was taken in Japan. And the Japanese used this technique instead of a big flower pot. We have flower pots which are one meter, one and a half meter in diameter. Flower pots, can you imagine? Black plastic flower pots, they're quite expensive to buy. They cost about 100 pounds to buy one of those flower pots one to one and a half meter wide, and we grow the plants in those big flower pots. So if you don't have open land, you can grow it in that. But usually these trees, they would have been grown in the open ground first, and then when they're dug up, they're put in these big containers. The bottom is uh, open, so the roots will go inside, but it won't spread outside. But you see it is raised about at least 30 to 50 centimeter above the ground. So it is really in effect like a big flower pot without a base. Now, this is a trident maple. Trident maple is a very fast growing tree. This tree would have been grown in the open ground for a few years and then dug up. And that is the result of growing for like 10, 15 years in the ground. Also these pines we have very big pines. Many of you will know that I like big trees. I don't like small trees, although we do sell small trees, but I love big trees because a big tree has a presence. It has a feeling that you don't get with small trees. Of course, you have to have the space to be able to show it. And you've got to be able to display it and have the staff to lift it. I know many of you have Malis and other workers to lift it but on the nursery, we have a lot of staff who lift it. But if you are on your own and you cannot handle it on your own, then don't think of big trees like this. Uh, 
And of course, the other factor is that in England, a lot of people have big gardens, especially some of our rich customers, they have very big gardens, so they don't mind buying the big bonsai. So growing in the open ground produces these big trees easily, and that is a very easy way of growing big trees, big bonsai. And of course, this is where we come to the root system. Now, one of the reasons for growing in the open ground may be to get thickness, but you can lose the control of how the roots develop. Now, there are all sorts of theories how you can get better root spread. Instead of growing it in a container or a tire, if you put a piece of uh, stone, we call them paving slabs. You know the flat slabs we use for paving the uh, walkways and um, pavements? We have big paving slabs, which are like, uh, I think 90 centimeters square, almost a meter, three foot by three foot. If you put it, say about half, half a meter, 45 to 50 centimeter deep in the ground, and then put the tree on top of it, the tap root will not go in the ground and the roots will spread sideways. So this is how you encourage roots to grow sideways. So that is why if you put a tire, sometimes the tire can stop this root spreading too much and it may not be good. So there's disadvantage in using that tire method. And this is another example of the maples that we develop growing in the open ground. So you can create this. Now this maple I will show you, uh, this hole on the side, on the left-hand side, that was a very, very thick root. But what I did over the years, I carved that root, that carved one thick root, which was about three, four inches in diameter and made it like two separate roots. So you can make a disguise to look a thick root, um, make it look thinner and smaller by carving it. Now, let me show you some trees that I came across in India. I don't know whose trees are these because I take these pictures when I'm in India, but some of you members will probably recognize your own trees. I show you this bougainvillea because bougainvillea I know grows very, very fast in the open ground. And of course you don't have to grow it yourself. A lot of these trees you will find growing in the roadside and uh, in front of other people's houses, you can beg them or pay them and buy it off them and you can get them. Now this is how we, after we take the trees up from the ground, if you don't have big flower pots, you can make a wooden box and you can grow it like this. So this is the second phase. After you dig it up, you put it in the ground like this. Now this picture I think was taken at Pravaji's place. And these are ficuses that they dig up from the hedges and then they put them in containers. And of course, once you get the thickness of root, you can then put it in container. But my advice would be rather than to put them in deep containers, if you put it in a much wider container to let the surface roots spread shallower rather than tall, you will get a better surface root. You'll get better nebari. Now here's the Prava. I remember she can probably talk about this tree. I remember doing this. This was taken from the hedge on a farm in Delhi. And in maybe like three, four years, we created a very nice bonsai just from digging it out from the hedge. It was on the perimeter of the garden. We dug it up. And then in, in next to no time, you can make very nice bonsai. And of course, in the tropics, you can't beat the ficus. They grow so fast that you get results very, very quickly. The more ficuses. So of course, at this stage, although you've got the trunk and then developing the top, it's important to develop the surface roots. Another of our great growers in India, your Bindrasab, I don't know whether he's attending the meeting, but he is an expert. This I think is a Muraya, if I'm not mistaken. Very nice tree. So rather than, I'm sure these trees are collected from either other people's gardens or whatever, and uh, they will grow. I'm always surprised that the ficuses can grow well in such small pots. But my advice is that once you've taken it out of the ground, 
uh, or out of other people's gardens, you should put it in a wider pot to get surface roots. Otherwise, you will not develop surface roots easily uh, by doing it in a small pot like this. The roots can also go round and round and it will defeat the purpose. Uh, this picture, believe it or not, is not in India. This was taken in Cyprus. I, always, I sometimes go to Cyprus to other clubs there. And this was a picture taken in Cyprus. We dug it up from someone's garden. And this is a thick trunk bougainvillea. And uh, I was just about to work on it. So as I say, you don't always have to have open ground. You can find other situations where you can get these trees. Again, this is a tree. I think this was probably in Mysore, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe could be 2010. And uh, there are a lot of this material around. So don't despair if you don't have land to grow it. You can probably buy them from nurseries. So that big tree, we cut it down to there and you start the training again. Again, I would say to put in bigger pot to develop the surface roots. And this, of course, is uh, the ficus queen, Rupan Deol Bajaj. And she's been collecting trees from buildings and from um, you know wherever she sees it. So as I say, you don't have to grow in open ground. Other people can do it for you, and you can get the results. I put that shoe next to that tree just to show the diameter of the trunk. I think this is in Prabhaji's garden. I don't know what variety is, probably bougainvillea. So a lot of these material are easily available. So you can uh, get that material, I'm sure, in India. Now let us come to what we do at Herons. You must be thinking I'm crazy. Let me show you this big tree. This tree I dug up, you won't believe, in 2019. This picture was taken. Uh, no, I'm sorry. This was taken in 2020. About 15 months ago, I dug this tree up. In, in the UK, we have a variety of tree called the hornbeam. The botanical name is Carpinus betulus. And this tree is every bit three meter tall, 10 foot high. And this tree was grown on our land for the last 30 years. And when I first planted it, it was no thicker than my finger. So in 30 years, this tree has become so thick. Okay, and it had to be lifted, dug up with a digger. Now I'm going to show you a very old picture. This picture was in 1986. And when I came to Herons, I planted 1000 pines. These are Scots pines in the field. These are just one and two year old pines that I planted in 1986. And then I have, uh, I don't know if I have got subsequent pictures, but to tell you a story after 20 years, some of the trees grew to 80 to 100 feet tall. And some of them got trunk diameter of three to four feet. That means one meter to 1.2 or 1.4 meter diameter. And I had to spend a lot of money to fell them. I had to cut it down because they got too big. So if you don't control it, you will lose control of the growth. So this is how we grow. There are different varieties. I think this is called Hawthorne. So we just grow it and let it grow. We don't do anything. We don't chop anything. We just let it grow tall because the taller you grow it, the more nourishment it gives the roots and the trunk and it will thicken the trunk. It is a mistake to keep cutting it down all the time. Maybe cut it after three, four years, five years, but for the first few years, don't cut it at all. Now, I was telling you about hornbeams. These are the hornbeams. These were probably grown in the ground for maybe 10 years. And the trunk diameter there is about anything from four inches to about 10 inches. I still think in terms of inches and feet rather than centimeters. So you're talking of maybe like easily 20 to 25 centimeter diameter. So these trees are hornbeams and you can see the lot of guti there. I do a lot of guti on these trees while they're growing. And then when the time comes, you just cut it with a saw and then you will start digging it up and training it. So that is the first cut.
Now, in this picture, I had a class at one point where while the trees are growing in the ground, rather than waste the material, why waste it? I prune the trees in the shape. If you can see some of the trees, they were already the top part looks like a bonsai with the S shape. So I do guti at the right place and I get a tree at the top. So instead of just cutting it down with a saw, I get more trees by constantly making more and more air layering. So that is one of the advantages of growing in the ground. Now, this is a picture, I think in New Orleans and Louisiana where they get trees. These are swamp cypress growing in the swamp. These, so sometimes people grow them naturally. I don't know how that picture kept in. Now, this is in our field and these are our pines. So I grow them for the thickness of trunk and at the right time, I then chop the tops off. You remember that picture I showed you in 1986, those pines became that thick, maybe in about 10 years. So already they had trunk diameters of about 20, 25 inches across at the base. So the green ones are pines, the brown ones are carpinus, and the red one is uh, Japanese maple. Now, now, why do I show this picture? This picture is not on the nursery, but sometimes I come across situations where people are clearing out their, their gardens. I have one or two customers who are friends of mine, and this customer of mine, he runs a demolition company. You know what a demolition company is? They go around uh, clearing the land. So if an old house is to be demolished, to build new flats on new apartment blocks, they do the job. And of course, some of these old houses with big gardens, they've got trees that have been growing for 10, 20, 30, 50 years. So he came across a situation where he had about four to 500 meters of yew hedging. Can you imagine how many plants there would be? 500 meters of a perimeter of the hedge. There must be hundreds and hundreds of plants. So he said, all those were going for nothing. They would be burnt. So would you like it? So I said, yes. So he dug them and I took my van there and we loaded the van up. So, so what we do when we get to the site, we cut all the excess branches, otherwise it wouldn't fit the van. So we cut the branches off. And of course, sometimes, this is on my own land, this is at Herons. Sometimes when the trees are too big, I burn them. I don't use all of them. If it gets too big and I can't handle it, they are just destroyed. It just shows how fast the trees grow. So it seems a waste, but sometimes you have to sacrifice some of the things. These were, um, I think, Zelkova serrata. I'll tell you another story about these trees. These trees I planted in 1986, but I soon realized that if you don't keep control of it, you lose control completely and they cease to become saleable as bonsai. Who would in their right mind buy a bonsai that thick? So I decided that I don't want so many, so I had to destroy them. So sometimes too much of a good thing is not good. Now coming back to that other picture. So these are the yew trees that, that demolition man uh, dug up and you can see the beautiful trunks, such beautiful trunks. And I cut them to about uh, 70 centimeter to one meter tall. And then I bring it back to the nursery and you can see what a lot of root there is. Although he dug it with a digger, they were not dug by hand, they were dug with a machine. And yet the roots are so compact. So when we come back to the nursery, those same trees were potted up in these big flower pots. And then that's how they grow. We grow them for two, three, maybe five years. We cut all the thick branches off and grow new branches for styling. Of course, sometimes we dig them up and put them in pots because you can't leave them in the ground forever. So these pines in the pots have been dug up at the right time, but can you see those trees at the back? Those trees have become too big. 
I keep them now just for environmental reasons because it's nice landscape feature, but they have ceased to become useful as bonsai, but they are useful source for guti, for air layering. So all is not wasted. So these tall trees, these was the Zelkova serrata I planted in 1986, and they are now like uh, 50 to 80 feet tall. I don't know how many meters that is, but they're very tall. So they've ceased to become useful as bonsai. So I just keep it for amenity purposes and for air layering. So they are much too tall, but this is what happens if you don't dig them up at the right time. Sometimes when you're growing in the open ground, you can shape them as well at the, uh, using not with wire, but just with bamboo poles like this. These are Ilex granata, which have been grown as garden trees or big bonsai. So this is how you space it, give it plenty of space to grow. So these are the ewes I showed you earlier. So they're grown in the flower pots and once they get new branches, a lot of people buy them at this stage and they buy them to style it themselves. We work on some, but a lot of people buy these as semi-trained trees. So I will show you some more of the operation. And of course, because in England, you know, you don't have so much manpower. So we always use machine. We hire a machine for one week, and in one week we can dig any amount of trees we want. You see how we've cut them down to a low height. So we cut the top off, and then we dig the stumps out. So with a digger, you can dig out a tree in literally three to five seconds. If the same tree you were to dig by hand would take you half a day to dig. So you know, using a machine saves a lot of time and money. So this is how we grow in the field. We grow them and then you see the trees on the right have not been pruned. The trees in the middle have been pruned. So we prune them to this height. And then when they're pruned to this height, we then dig them up. Now this next picture, this is when we took the tree out in March of 2020. This was a 10 foot high hornbeam. And of course, unless you have a digger, you cannot dig this tree up. So this has been grown for 30 years to get that size of trunk. And you can see how big it is. The trunk, I would say, is almost like 18 inches, 24 inches in diameter at the base. The body is huge. But you also notice we cut off all the branches. Now, this is these are Japanese maples. We are self-sufficient in Japanese maple and we grow them in the ground. And when they reach a height of about six feet and when the trunk is thick enough, we then go about pruning the top off. We can't make guti all the time. Otherwise, if you spend all your life doing guti, you will never get a bonsai. So this is another larch. This is a very difficult species to air layer called Japanese larch. And that trunk was about six inches diameter and we are able to make guti with six inch diameter. So while they're in the ground, we also make air layering with it. So this was a big exercise. And these are more after digging. You see that big black container, that is a one meter diameter black container. So if a tree has got a very big root spread, we put them in those big black containers but otherwise we put them in these big black flower pots. So we dig it with the digger. This is the hedge on our land. Now this picture was taken only in uh, April of this year, exactly 12 or 13 months after digging the tree. And this is the effect of the tree. And in fact, I pruned a lot of the branches off because it didn't have a lot of branches. So this species of tree produces uh, branches very, very quickly. These are Japanese tried maple. These we also grow in the ground and when they're at the right stage, we pot them up and then we will put them in bonsai training pots in due course. 
So this is the effect of growing in the open ground. You get the results like this. And of course, there's a detail of how you make taper and all that. So this is how, what happens when you grow trees in the ground. That's a Japanese maple. Even that one, that trunk is about 10 to 12 inches diameter. It can still be dug, but it would be difficult to make a bonsai from that. So tree like that we probably use for air layering, guti. Now these are pines that we grow in the field. They can always be used for landscaping. Now this picture was taken in New Orleans. And this guy is called Guy Guidry from uh, Louisiana. And he collects from the wild. And these grow in the swamps in Louisiana. And this is swamp cypress that he didn't grow it in his land, but they're just grown wild. So collecting from the wild is equivalent to open ground growing. So open ground growing is nothing new. And these are the ewes that we dig up from the field. This picture was taken in Madeira of a ficus. And this one, I think the diameter must have been like 12, 12 or 15 foot diameter tree. But if you imagine it to be in a bonsai pot, it would make a beautiful bonsai. Look at it. I don't know whose tree this is. Oh, probably I know. But Nibari is good there. And this is Prabhaji's tree. This was taken from a hedge. I think she was growing it on the side of the house. She will remember. I remember helping her make this one and taking up a new leader. So growing hedges is also equivalent to growing in the open ground. Another Pravas ficuses. So while trees are growing in the ground, we do air layering, so this air layering, so rather than waste it. For us, we can get an air layering in six months to one year. So that's not long to wait. So you already get a ready-made bonsai with a thick trunk. And then when we've taken that out, we can then dig the bottom out. Now this tree is on our land and this is a giant redwood. You won't believe I planted this tree in 1991, which is about 30 years ago. And at that time when I planted it, the trunk was no more than one inch in diameter, one inch. And after 30 years, that trunk is about six to eight foot in diameter. So it just shows how fast these trees grow. And of course, it's a giant redwood, so they grow fast. So it just shows how fast you can get the results by simply growing in the open ground. But this is not going to be made for bonsai. These are the maples. This is uh, made from trees that we grow in the ground. And this again, was I think 20 years in the ground to get a thick trunk like this. If you grew up maple in the pot for 20 years, you won't get that effect. More examples of things. I know that's in a very small pot, but uh, that's only a temporary pot, but it will have very fine roots. These are junipers that we grow in our field. This has been dug up about three, four years back, and we are going to start styling it. Okay, now I've finished that presentation. This is the time I can take questions, so I leave it to uh, your convener there to organize the question and answer session. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Master Peter. Um, so, uh, you know, we have 
a few questions uh, that were asked. So if anyone um, would like to ask the question, you can use um, the raise hand button and uh, we would love to take your questions as well. Yes, Uma, ma'am. My question is, what is your advice for a small garden? All of us don't have farms. They have a smaller area. So what is the advice for a smaller garden? Well, as I said, you only need a garden. As long as you're putting the plant in the ground, that is equivalent to growing in the ground. So set aside one area where you plant it among the flowers or something, you know, ficus or whatever, and you grow it in the ground for two to three years, maybe five years, and you'll get very thick plant. Let it grow to about like two meters tall, not bigger than that. And then you can either air layer the top or just let it grow and develop. So as I say, it is just having the facility to access a piece of land, whether it's your garden or a big farm, it doesn't matter. So I don't think I can give better advice than that. Thank you. Um, any other questions, uh, you know, from uh, the, you know, the 13 panelists that had asked those questions, you all can use the raise hand or put it on the chat box and uh, we would love to take your question as well. Uh, till then, I'll just read out uh, some chats that are there um, on, on the, uh, the chat box. Any I difference? have a list of questions here that was sent to me. If I can call out the name, it may be a better way to do it. So I have here Jayanti from Bonsai Exotica Club asking question. Would she like to ask that question again? Is she in the audience? Yes, I'll just get her on. Mr. Jayanti? Yeah. Yes, I'm here. Hi, Peter. Yeah, do you remember what you asked me? Yes, I did. I, I was asking you how... Uh, I mean, you very easily, I saw your uh, other YouTube presentation on uh, lifting plants from the ground and you'd ask, uh, I mean, you just said lift it from the ground. And for me, uh, the main problem was when we put it in the ground and you take it out, of course, we don't have a big digger and stuff. More often than not, it goes into a shop. So what do you do to minimize the shop and how do you make the plant survive? Well, to minimize the shock, of course, you've got to make sure you take enough root. Some people are very, uh, you know, naive. They don't take enough root. They dig too close to the trunk. So if you don't take enough root, obviously the tree will suffer shock. Sometimes if the root goes deep, you, you know what a tap root it is, go straight to the bottom. You can cut the tap root off, but leave the side shoots and put it in as big a container as you can with good compost, you know, here we use like a PT type compost, you know, not just mud or sand, but put it in a big pot and then grow it. That, that reduces the shock. Not too small a pot. The bigger the pot, the better. Okay? Yes. Thank you. And then the <laughs> second question. If I may, uh, yes, you finished. There is Me? one. I think Uma has just asked about that. I, I have then. Archana Jain was asking, is Archana there? Yes, Master Peter. Yeah. Uh, ma'am, you have to unmute yourself. Archana, ma'am. Okay. Uh, yeah. Hello. I just yeah. want to know ki when we dig the plant and put it in a big container, uh, side branches sometimes they are not there. And when they I mean, come, they are very thin in uh, size. So how do we achieve the thickness of side branches? There's a thing called patience. <laughs> All right? You just got to be patient. Now, you notice that the slide presentation we made, yes. when we dig plants up, we cut all the branches off. We don't like to use thick branches because if you use thick branches with a uh, normal tree, the contrast between the thick branch and the trunk is not big enough. So we cut off all thick branches or just use the thick branches for making gin and grow new branches again. So that is not a problem. 
most people or most of us, when we dig up trees, we cut off all the branches and start again. So don't worry oh. about that. Yeah, so how long it takes to grow, I mean, grow them little Depends things. on the variety. Maybe in one, two years, you'll get the branches. That's not too long to wait. Okay. Thank all you, right. sir. Okay, then after that, I have the IBS club secretary, uh, Varadja Suraya Kumar, who is that? Manager, ma'am. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, to begin with, uh, you have answered the branches part of my question. Yes. You may become very thick, so you just explain that. I just want to know what's the best season, kind of, because in uh, England, I think you mentioned March or something. Springtime, yeah. Springtime. And in India also, the, when we would be sticking to uh, the March, April kind of thing, just before summer? I think in India, India it's hot mostly. So, yes. well, because I left India so many years ago and I didn't really do bonsai once when I was in India, I would imagine uh, knowing the climate in most parts of India, what we call spring in England, about February, March time, won't work for you. Of course, it gets too hot by then. You're just getting into summer. And in the middle of winter is not a good time. And my reckoning, my logic is that the rainy season may be a very good time. Those of you who are more experienced growers will probably correct me or give me some advice as to what the best season to dig up in India. From my uh, reckoning of the climate, I think the rainy season is a good time to transplant or dig up. So I may be wrong, but you may put me right. But I certainly don't think spring in India because you don't have a really a spring at all. You know, your spring is bare just a few days mm -hmm. and it uh, then gets too hot. And if you dig just before winter, it gets too cold. So I still think the rainy season is the best time to dig. Thank you so much, okay. sir. Okay, then I have another question from the Shusti Bonsai Club. Maya, my good friend Maya Sitaram, are you there? Um, Maya, ma'am, would you like to ask oh. a question? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Yeah. Hi, Peter. Good yes. Good to see you again. Yeah. Yeah. So my question was, uh, this is something we learned from uh, Master Pedro Morales. Yeah. We did a course with him on tropical bonsais. There he taught us to put uh, uh, growing material in tires. So my question to you was, if you do this, and if you have ever tried this, which I'm sure you have, what is the difference no, between that. removing from, what is the difference between removing from tires and whatever you put straight onto the ground in terms of its mortality rate, because the roots are closer to you when uh, closer to the plant main trunk when it's in the tire, you don't have that kind of control when you have planted it on the ground. So have you, can you throw some light on uh, which is right. better? If you took the course, did you in fact ask that gentleman why the logic of growing it in the tire? Do you remember what yes. he told you? Yes, yes, it, it, it sort of creates heat and I have also tried it in my farm. I have tried it, but I have not removed it from the tires as yet. It's about recent, about a year or so. I've not really removed it from the tires. The thickness yeah. is more if you do it on the tires. That's what he said, and I also find it true, but I am worried about removing it from the tires. And I want to see the difference between that and what happens when you put it directly onto the ground. Well, you should do an experiment. The only way you learn is from doing experiments. I also keep doing experiments. Do it with and without and see what the difference is. I'm not convinced that it generates that much heat because I said that in one when I was showing you those pictures, we use these big containers, which is a one, one meter big container. That is like a very big tractor tire, isn't it? But so putting it in a, a tire is almost like planting it in a open bottom container. That means like a big plant right. without a base. Right. So it in, will encourage, or it'll stop the roots spreading sideways, but it may encourage the roots to grow into the soil, uh, may make it easier to lift. So it is really like growing in a big pot. So I don't think there is um, much more advantage than growing in a big container. That is my feeling. Only that it is access the roots into the ground. 
the need to the girl yeah thank you this just one thing i can i want to say peter yes so yeah the slide that you showed of mysore fike that yes. was in 2001 that oh, was in okay. 2001 that's the first time you came to mysore what yeah, what we met before that street? also in bangalore are those streets still there yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Are those still there? Did, one juniper you had done there. for me is gone. Okay. There was a juniper which you did is gone, but that tree is still there. That was in 2001. You came again in 2010, and that's the last you came to my saw. <laughs> well, if it wasn't for the pandemic, I would come. <laughs> but yeah, you know, love to have you that, sometime. Yes. Now that there is Zoom, I don't need to come anymore. <laughs> no, we'd like to have you here again. Yeah. Definitely, okay. you're most welcome. All right. Okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll try and I'll try and come again. Thank okay. You. Thank okay. You. Nice to see you, Maya. Okay. Thank now, I, the next question I have is from Renu Vesh. Uh, so, Renu, can I get you to ask your questions? Yes, Peter. Hi, Peter. How are you? I'm fine. Uh, so, my question uh, is because in Delhi. we are not able to get very nice thick junipers so how do we grow them in the ground because if we put them in the ground you know they uh, when we dig them out they don't seem to survive so how would one go about growing a thick juniper because the material to get thick juniper is not available in the nurseries out here i'm not sure that is entirely true because the last time i was in delhi and at prabhas place she has some juniper that have got very very thick trunks so you got to ask her of course the variety of juniper you grow in you india you know the audio the never audio makes a big trunk doesn't make a thick thick trunk easily you should try getting one or two of these varieties that we grow in this country the audio is not very clear ha oh. Uh, master peter we can hear you uh, mrs renu I, i think the the uh, network is from your end we can hear master uh, peter very clearly okay okay what i suggest if you're digging up from the ground and it dies the best thing is to put it in a big container don't put it in a small yeah. container yes ma'am that may yeah, i'm not able to uh, get the video or the or yeah i'm seeing you now i'm not getting it once are you seeing me i'm not able to see you just a second yeah 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 okay okay no but peter i can't see your video i can't see you well then okay anyway my question is this only that how do we get grow thick uh, junipers in delhi no i think you can grow because i was just saying when i went to prabhas garden some years back she was growing junipers in her uh, garden and they got very thick trunks you know two to four inch trunk juniper so it is possible and i think i've seen also in sabina's garden she had junipers with thick trunks so uh, it is not true that you can't get it i think you can either you're growing the wrong variety or whatever so it is possible to get thick trunk just persevere, persevere and ask around maybe the variety you grow is not a very good one if you grow a good varieties you can get thick trunks there are so many types of juniper but so i did i did grow uh, some in the ground you know i am basically talking about juniper prostata yes I think we need to Because ask for that. Because juniper prostrata is the only thing that will survive here in Delhi. Ah, but I'm sure she is okay. growing that variety. Uh, well, it is very right, thick. You got to sort it out with her. Okay, Sorry? I see. Sorry. Yes, Master uh, Peter. And would you like to take any other questions? Ah, uh, if. Prabha is on the network. Can she say a few things about her junipers? Prabha, ma'am, um, if, if you can, uh, you can unmute yourself using the unmute button. Is Prabha there? 
I'm just trying to get her to unmute. Uh, Prabha, ma'am. No. Maybe we'll circle back. Um, okay. You know. Right. Okay. So let me just go down the list. Uh, I've got Sonali Chaudhary. Uh, Sonali, ma'am, is not not here at, at present, okay. uh, Master okay. Peter. And then we have uh, Sujata Bhatt. Is, yes. Is yes. Good afternoon, uh, Peter, sir. Um, so I think you answered a part of my question. My first question was, uh, when do you do the trunk chop? When it is in the ground or, you know, once you transfer it to the... Basically, what I wanted to ask is, do you keep on working on the tree when it's in the ground or you wait no. for it to uh, grow? And uh, the second part of my question was, how do you treat those big trunk chops, you know, um, to prevent right. rotting and that? Okay. We make the trunk chop when it is in the ground, maybe one or two years before lifting, maybe one year before lifting. So it makes it easier to handle. Or as I say, we do guti and use the top for another tree. So you can do that. And uh, also the branches are not worried because we grow the branches from scratch. So, in fact, it's better to remove the branches because if you have too many branches, it makes too much demand on the roots. So it reduces the transpiration. You know what transpiration? That means the leaves lose water. So if you don't have so many branches, the tree won't transpire so much. And the chop, we usually seal with something. Depends on how vigorous the varieties are. Some varieties, if they lose much moisture from the top, then the tree can suffer. It can even die. But if you seal it, we use that like a tar paint or any sealant we can put on the top that will stop the moisture getting lost from the trunk chop area. So that is what we do. Uh, what else was it you asked? Did I ask uh, all those questions? Yeah, and uh, how do you kind of treat it up once it once you do the trunk chop? Uh, you know, it's quite visible. So no, that takes time. Getting tapers time. You it start time. growing a new shoot. Then when it grows to about one or two feet, you cut it down to a few inches, cut that then go again. It can take 10 years to get cooked taper. Oh. That is the final part of bonsai. Growing in the field or in open ground is just to get the thick trunk. It is not about creating taper. You can make the taper in the ground if you want. You can do that. It, you can get it quicker. That is one way of getting taper. That means train it in the ground, but then you still have to lift it at some point. That is, in fact, a good point. You can start developing the taper while it's in the ground. It may develop faster as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Um, Master Peter, there was also a question uh, by Mrs. Mangala Rao about the curved uh, tree line. Yes. Line. Yeah, okay. Can she ask it? Yes. Mrs. Mangala, you can unmute yourself. Hello? Yes. Is it okay? Correct? Yes, yes, Ms. Mangala. We can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Correct? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yes, my okay. question was my question for um, my question was when we grow plants in the ground to make it thick, sometimes they grow very fast and grow straight. And becomes very uh, stiff. Uh, after that, getting uh, movement to the trunk line, it is very difficult. So, is it advisable to wire the plant when the plant is pliable, and with the wire we can keep it in the ground for getting uh, a curve? Is it possible? You can, but if you do that, it will not take that shape. It will overtake and it'll send a new leader. You'll find another shoot which is growing very thick. So. Uh -huh. Usually when we grow in the trunk, uh, go in the ground, it's just to get the base of the tree, the uh -huh. top uh, 30 centimeters or so thick. If you uh -huh. want to make it shaped, then you have uh -huh. to keep cutting it and grow a new leader, cut and grow method to get it in going another direction, then cut again so you can keep cutting to get oh. like a curvy Clip shape. And grow metal. You know how the okay. Chinese grow, cut and grow, oh, yeah. you know? You cut at uh -huh. the right place and then let it go in that direction, cut again and then keep growing it that, that way. Yeah. So you can get change of direction in the open ground by doing that. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, then the next one I still have is Bharti Nagraj. Yes. yes. Ma'am, uh, can you? 
Namaste, Peter, sir. Yeah, what's your question? Uh, my question, uh, while growing in the bonsai material in the ground, if the <clears throat> fertile land is not there, how we can make the <clears throat> soil proportion to use, the, use in the beginning for the pit? Well, if your soil is not good, as I say, you've got to put a manure, like you can put your cow dung and things like that. Uh, as I mentioned, we have very fertile soil where we are. So I don't put any fertilizer, any additive. I sometimes put like horse manure, that means annual manure in the ground, but you don't have to. If you've got fertile land, you don't have to do that. But if the soil is very poor, then you need to put that, uh, you know, organic matter. We call it organic matter. If you have very sandy soil, then put lots of organic matter to help it. That will promote much finer growth. So you can do that. Um, as for fertilizer, again, you can put all sorts of fertilizer. I don't know what fertilizers you use in your country, uh, but uh, in this country, most gardeners can buy fertilizer from garden shops and all that. They put the fertilizer in. It certainly helps to boost the growth. Okay. How often we have to feed the uh, plant in the ground itself then? Oh, it depends, on, it depends on your soil conditions. Again, as I say, when we grow in the ground, we don't feed it in the ground. I'm just speaking from my experience. Okay. I don't have to feed the ground. You'll find that the soil is usually quite nutritious anyway. It's when you start putting in the pot that you need to fertilize more. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. And then I have Veer Chaudhary from Hyderabad. Yes, Mr. Veer is present with us. Hi, Peter. Good evening. Yeah, hi. Yeah. So my, my question was actually part of previous question regarding uh, if you don't have fertile land, uh, is it good to use either organic uh, fertilizer or inorganic fertilizer? Uh, which could be the best option? I think you have to use both. If you have, okay. say, very sandy soil, putting organic matter, even leaf mold, you know, leaf, uh, rotted leaf mold or animal manure will help yeah. to give the organic content to the soil. And of course, you can supplement it with uh, chemical fertilizer as well. Everything okay. helps. Yeah. All right. And also, I wanted to know, like, uh, if you bring a plant from a temperate climate, like, how do you acclimatize it? No, no, don't even waste your time. I think unless you live in a very cold place, like in Himachal or Dehradun, and very cold place where you have near freezing temperature, don't try growing temperate climate plant. A lot of people... Okay. As you know, I have a very strong YouTube following and a lot of Indian uh, YouTube followers on that. They keep begging me, please send me a maple. Can I have maple? Can I grow maple? <laughs> Don't waste your time. Don't waste your time. Just grow things which are local to you. In the tropics, yes. there's so many species that you can do. You know, a lot of them are untried. The thing is to try. Most of my bonsai knowledge and experience, as you know, I always pride myself in being self-taught. You know, if you are intelligent enough, and also Malis are not uh, stupid, even as in Mali, they can do experiments. Most of my bonsai knowledge is acquired from doing experiments. The more you experiment and more you try by doing things which are local to you, local species, that's the best way to learn. So I have, I'll tell you another story. In, in the West, there are a lot of people who like to show off. They show off, maybe in the East also, there are people who show off. These guys, they say, oh, I've been trained in Japan. You know, you probe a little more, you'll find out that all of it is, is GUP. You know what GUP is? So I once came across one of our friends in the UK, and in his CV, he said he was trained in Japan. I won't mention that guy's name in case it embarrasses him. But I then met him one day at a bonsai meeting and I said, I, how come you say you're trained in Japan? He says, I went to the first World Bonsai Convention in 1988, I think, or 89. So I said, I went to that convention as well. So I said, so I, I attended a lecture there. So he said, I was trained in Japan by attending one lecture in Japan. So you get a lot of people who try to boost their credentials by saying they're trained in Japan. Just because you're trained in Japan, it means nothing. You know, when I came to the UK, the IIT degree was not recognized. Can you believe it? 1963 IIT degree was not recognized. 
but four years later, it was recognized. I had to start off life as a mystery because they didn't recognize the degree. But I did rise, you know, it's what you're capable of doing that matters. The degree is only a piece of paper. It is what you're able to do that matters. So don't be put off, you know, just experiment and try things. That is the best way to learn and to uh, develop your bonsai skills. And you are a very good example, you know, you are self-taught from what I can gather, you know, you, yes, you're doing yes, some good yes. things. And do you, continue Victor. doing that, you know, you will uh, improve no end. So keep thank it up. Victor. Yes, thank you so much. And then we have one from Sudesh Yadav. Uh, hello, Peter, sir. Hello, My there. question is, uh, material in ground tends to grow very fast and develops longer distance between two inter nodes. When yes. such a material is being used, it uh, may create a design which has sparse branching. So how can we avoid it when we design this uh, bonsai, which is dug from the ground? As I said, when we grow in the ground, the object is just to get thick trunk. Don't worry about the branches. And I again, reinforce, I cut all, all the branches and start again. Once you start putting in a container and the branches grow, then the internodes will get short. So don't try and develop too much in the ground, the internodes and the branches at that point. After taking it up from the ground, cut all the branches out and start again. So that more or less answers that question. My second question is about uh, getting the characteristics on the trunk because when we grow material in the ground, it doesn't have any characteristics. It just, you know, just grows like a, a stump or a log. So when we uh, you know try to develop develop it as a bonsai, what do we keep in mind? You can distress it. You know you can bash the trunk, you know, make a hole in the trunk, carve the trunk, and then when it heals over, you get some character to it. You know, just hit it, you know, with a spade or something and give some character. <laughs> it's called distressing it. it. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, I don't know. We can throw the floor open to other people who have questions. I don't know who else is uh, connected to there is one question here, which you might want to take. Yes. Mrs. Santosh, very much. Hello, sir. My question is again about the fertilizer. Yes. Since they are the future bonsai plants, we want an even development. Yes. So do you use different kinds of NPKs during their growth period? Yes, we and do. Oh. Yeah. Uh, again, speaking from temperate climate trees, in mm -hmm. the springtime, the general rule is to use high nitrogen. I don't know, you don't have a spring, but maybe in your monsoon time you can use. Nitrogen produces green leaves, green growth, but it doesn't harden the tree. Maybe it doesn't apply to the tropics so much. In the temperate climate, in the winter time, the trees suffer very cold conditions. And if the branches are not strong enough, they can freeze and they can die. So towards the latter part of the growing season, we uh, re reduce the num amount of nitrogen and emphasize the PK side of it. So the phosphorus and potassium, we increase in the latter half of the year and that strengthens the tree. I don't know, as I say, whether it would apply to tropical conditions, but that's- We do the same. We do, you the, do the same. same. Okay, yeah. you can try it. Um, this is where I think in different countries, different growing conditions, you got to experiment with what is uh, appropriate to your conditions. You know, I can't give you the answers. Like a lot of people say, what is the ideal soil? Now, where do you live? You know, I can't tell you what is the best soil. What I use in England as the best soil for a bonsai it may not be the best soil for growing in India or different parts of India. South India will be different from Delhi. Bombay would be different from Delhi. So there you are, you got to see what the local growers have managed to find as the best soil for those particular conditions. So you got to adapt it. So there is no fixed rule for anything. This is where the art is so interesting. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Master. Thank you. Also, uh, Master, you wanted uh, Mrs. Prabha to, to uh, you wanted to have a word with Mrs. Prabha. She's unmuted and she's available if you like. All right. Mrs. Prabha? Yes. Hello, Prabhaji. Yes, uh, Peter. You saw the uh, junipers long ago. Yes. And now they are uh, five feet tall. 
Oh gosh. And I'm ha and I'm growing them like uh, ordinary tree like a uh, juniper garden tree, tree in the yes. garden tree and they are looking very pretty. I will send you the photograph. But there you are you got to teach those youngsters why what they're doing wrong. You're growing it so well in your garden, isn't it? <laughs> yes, well it is lucky that the position was right and I am giving a lot of NPK also and also the uh, the liquid manure which okay. I find is very good for it. Okay. Liquid manure does a lot of good. But you've also got some in big containers, isn't it? Big pots? Yes. In yes, garden, I remember. Yes. So it is possible to grow them in pots? Well, I am growing them in pots. Some of them are doing very well, others are not. They have also, uh, the branch problem becomes very major. The branches don't grow easily. Oh. And I find that some of the branches, prominent branches, they are gone. When they're put in pots? When they're put in pot. Maybe so the thing I, is to, to use big pot, I, use a big pot. Yeah, it is quite big, Peter. Oh. But I am changing the style also then. Okay. And when I change the style, it looks okay because without that main branch, also it grows. Okay. Maybe next time, you know, someone comes, we'll give you some cuttings of some types of juniper here and can try it growing those. But uh, I think you have to teach Renu one or two things. <laughs> how to grow juniper. No, no. Jun <laughs> she <laughs> has good junipers also. <laughs> she has that. good junipers. Uh, okay. Yes. And okay. Sabina, of course, has very nice junipers. Yes, I know. I remember. Yes. Sunil does a lot of work on junipers. Okay. Her husband. Okay. Okay, then. Nice to talk to you. Yes, I'm waiting for you to come to India. We are yes. all waiting. As soon as the COVID allows, I will come. Yes, yes. <laughs> we are waiting. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs> all right. Thank you, uh, Master Peter, for so, so patiently answering all those questions and honestly inspiring us with, with all your responses. Um, so, ma ma Master Peter, would you... Uh, like to go ahead with the presentation at this point uh, or would you you know no, I just before i sign off i think if you can kindly have a look at my friend shomo hi <laughs> as i told you he is one of my alumni friends from iit karakpur he's a top top hr consultant in england and he came to me as a customer but i didn't know he was from iit so he helps me with my it stuff so there you are. So the IIT connection is very strong. And he's from Ranchi originally, but from IIT Kharagpur. What batch are you? Uh, 2001. 2001. <laughs> I graduated in 62. Oh. <laughs> anyway, there you are. <laughs> it's nice to see you, Mr. Shomo. All right, um, Master Peter, uh, just a couple of things before we end. If, if you like, there are a few more questions on the chat box, if you'd like to take those. Um, or, or we, we could always um, you know, move ahead with the program. Well, I'll go through it very quickly. Yes. Sure. So, thank, thank you. Thank you, Master. Let me tell yes. you a question. First one question which is here is, uh, if suppose the root escapes from a pot which yes. is on the ground, yes. does it grow exactly like, uh, uh, like in the ground? Yes, it does. Both, it's a halfway house. It reduces the vigor to some extent, but it also gives it better growth, makes the watering easier. I have very exa good examples. On YouTube, I'm going to show you a video of what happened to one of my trees. Now, if it is in a pot, do you think you need to change the soil in the pot or should the soil be exactly the same, like because it has already gone into the soil? No, you don't need to change the soil. Okay. What is a good time for uh, doing, like taking it out from the ground? Is it when it is growing or is it when it is dormant? In England, we do it just before the springtime, just before growth starts, at the end of dormancy period. I don't think in India they have dormancy period or not such a long period, so it doesn't really apply. Okay. Then there is one more question here, which is about... Uh, when did that question go? 
Uh, how is horse manure compared to cow or goat manure? Do you have any? I don't know if you've got, uh, you got to get a soil scientist to compare it. You know, you can analyze the chemical composition of it. Like in this country, we have chicken manure. Chicken manure apparently is very, very strong, very strong stuff. And uh, it is so strong that you don't use too much of it. You only need to use a little bit. So uh, uh, you got to get it analyzed before you use it. But from what I gather, cow manure is very benign. That is a very good gentle manure to use. And last question, is there a thumb rule as to how thick it should be before you start? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think eight to 10 inches is about maximum. Bigger than that becomes difficult to handle. You won't be able to lift it. You won't be able to lift it. And of course in China, I'm sure many of you have now been to China. You've seen bonsai. They are 10, 15 feet tall and in big stone granite pots. So how big do you want to use it? It depends how, whether you enjoy it and whether you can handle it. That's the thing. Some people do it just for the heck of it. But I like growing trees, maximum about 1.2 meter tall with trunk diameter about 30 centimeter. And of course, being a commercial nursery, we have people who actually buy these trees. They do enjoy having trees like this. Okay, anything else? No, I, 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 that's great, Master Peter. I just wanted to thank, um, of course, Mr. Shomu and, and thank you for patiently taking all these questions, um, you know, through interacting with them as well as through the chat box. And now, um, Master Peter, uh, we have Mrs. Renu Vesh, as you know, who's the SBDF International Consultant for WBFF, uh, who would like to say a few words. Hey, by the way, before I cut off, may I just say hello to these people from Pakistan, Nepal, and Bangladesh, although we've not had questions from them. It is very nice that we have people from different countries, like sport, you know, pastimes like bonsai, all these political differences uh, don't matter. So I think that is a good way. That's why when they say, you know, bonsai and all these things promote peace, it is true, you know, why bother about all these things? So I'm very pleased that these groups could interact with us and thanks to you and congratulations to you that you're able to involve them as well. So top marks to you, okay? Thanks. So um, Peter, Sneha had asked me that I should say a few words about you and I was just remembering the first time I met you. Uh, and that was in the year 1993, the first South Asian Bonsai Convention was held by in Mumbai by Mrs. Jyoti and Nikunj Parekh. And uh, uh, if you remember, there were uh, bomb, uh, uh, bomb blasts in Mumbai yes. just a few days before the convention. And uh, uh, there were quite a few masters, I think, who were invited to uh, conduct the, conve uh, the convention. And uh, when I reached there, I, I attended that convention. And when I reached there, I came to know that uh, all but one master, they had canceled their ticket because of the fearful situation that Mumbai was in at that time. And that one brave master was you, Peter Chan, whom we saw conducting all the three days of the work, the workshop and demonstrations and really tirelessly working uh, from morning till evening. And it was great to see you. Uh, you know, that was my first interaction with you. And uh, here we in Delhi have uh, been very, very fortunate, I must say, to have had uh, many programs with you. That is uh, thanks to Mrs. Uh, Prabhash Sridhar, who very, very graciously hosts uh, a beautiful garden whenever you visit uh, uh, Delhi. And I am so happy to hear that you are accepting Mrs. Prabhashi's uh, invite. <laughs> because earlier you said virtual world, I don't need to come. So that was not a, <laughs> not very happy to hear <laughs> that statement. <laughs> and then uh, also in the uh, Indian Bonsai Association, we held our uh, bonsai convention in 2005. And um, I remember, Peter, you were the first person we always think of, uh, I think anywhere in India, in fact, when there is a convention where it is Baroda or it is Karjat or other places or Delhi, I think you're one master who is just so popular and we all feel 
so much at home and uh, you know comfortable with you so thank you very much for being who you are thank you very thank much you. thank you thank <laughs> you um Th thank you, uh, Mrs. Renu. And at this point, I'd also uh, like to call uh, Mr. Ehsan uh, from um, from Pakistan uh, oh. to say a few words. Hello, Mr. Ehsan. Uh, can you unmute yourself? Uh, thank you very much indeed. And I just uh, would like to thank uh, CBF and uh, Peter Chen also for having me on this meet. Basically, I just wanted to be a part of it. <coughs> and uh, uh, basically, you see, I was just looking to start. Uh, I was just uh, looking forward for advice to start uh, uh, creating bonsai on a mass production level, you see. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have much space at my home for growing uh, in the ground or uh, large places like uh, beds, you know. So it was a very informative meeting and uh, although I joined a little late, uh, for which I am very sorry. <laughs> and uh, what I have gained through this uh, meeting is a, is a huge, tremendous knowledge. Although I've been practicing bonsai since about last uh, 15 or 16 years, uh, Pakistan Bonsai Society has been uh, very active in international forums also and we would certainly look forward to uh, sir peter chan if he, if he could arrange a meeting with our society as well uh, although due to covid uh, situations he may not be able to visit this part of the world but we would love to have him on a chat meeting or on a zoom meeting with pakistan bonsai society as well so thank you very much peter chan sir and thank you very much SCPF, for having me on this week and i still look forward to joining you guys uh, in the future also. Thank you very much. Thank you very okay. much. In, inshallah, it will happen one day. <laughs> inshallah, inshallah. Thank you. Thank, looking forward to see you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Hassan. And um, you, 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 you'll get some, you know, since you've joined late, don't worry. Um, through the SABF circles, um, we, can, we can request uh, to, to view the session from the beginning as well. And at this point, I'd like to call upon uh, Mr. Sudhir Jada, the Secretary of South Asia Bonsai Federation, uh, to give the vote of thanks. Hello, Mr. Sudhir. Hello. Thank you, Karan. Um, good evening. I'm Sudhir Jada, Secretary of South Asia Bonsai Federation. Before I raise the vote of thanks, I have an important update for all of you. As Sam just announced, uh, South Asia Bonsai Federation uh, has launched its uh, SAPF Digital Bonsai School. Let me give you some more information about uh, this school. The school is for uh, bonsai enthusiasts who have already learned the art of making bonsai. The platform is for advanced learning through digital media. The artist will be taught to use digital technology in bonsai. So it's going to be very, very useful to all the people uh, and people from all the generations. The school will be virtual and all classes will be conducted online. Uh, these will not be physical classes. They will be uh, run through remote and online. The artist will have, have to pay some nominal charges for the course and the course will have a fixed number of sessions. Let me just take you through uh, the team uh, who will be working uh, on this uh, school. Uh, the team will be guided by, of course, uh, the president of uh, South Asia Bonsai Federation, Mrs. Sneem Prashad. And uh, the team comprises of uh, Veer Chaudhary from Kakinara, Andhra Pradesh, Ajay Mohanty, Virendra Singh Chauhan, Gaurav Majumdar, Neel Upadhyay from Bangalore, uh, Calvin Gurino from Mumbai, and of course me. So we are going to run the school and the, the first session of the school will be conducted. The introductory session will be uh, conducted on the 15th of August and uh, that will be at 4 p.m. India time. So uh, we will be uh, talking about the school more. We'll be coming back to you with uh, more information about the school. So please hang on to them. Now, uh, let me uh, go to the vote of thanks. On behalf of South Asia Bonsai Federation, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Master Peter Chan for blessing us with such a wonderful session today. Sir, it's a great honor for SABF to host you. And we had immense learning from this session that we had today. 
I would also like to thank uh, Peter Sir's associate, Mr. Shomu, for his support. SFBF is thankful to all international and national level participants for joining us for this uh, program today. And I would like to thank uh, Karan Mulchandani and his team members from Enlighten Sapiens for managing this show for us. So, uh, to see you all and goodbye until we meet again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that. And um, beautiful, uh, beautiful, very, very inspiring comments of, of gratitude coming on the chat box for you, uh, Master Peter. Uh, so thank you for, for this really informative session. Okay. Bye. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Shomu, thank you. Thank you. And um, you can reach out to SABF using the details mentioned on the screen. Um, and the WhatsApp numbers, as well as the email addresses. And of course, we are enlightened sapiens, and we conduct sessions just like today on various topics of art and gardening and hiking, basically passion-based, uh, and we love to hold a session for you. Uh, you can reach out to us using the, the information on the screen. Thank you once again, and hopefully see you all very, very, very soon. Thank you. <laughs>